Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're uh, enjoying the conference as much as uh, I am. And I want to take a minute and just thank uh, Anthony and the team at Skybridge uh, and SALT for putting this on and inviting this distinguished panel. Um, why don't we do just very brief introductions, and then we'll jump right in. I'm the CEO of uh, Vulcan Forged. Um, you may know us by our, our token PYR. Um, we were originally a game studio first and moved into the world of blockchain and NFT gaming a couple of years ago. Grew to about 200,000 users and um, we're on our journey to see how the whole blockchain and metaverse space pans out. <laughs> well, that's an interesting segue. So um, obviously, uh, when you do prep for something like this, there are certain catalyst events. And the last six months has, uh, has been daunting, to say the least. Um, I think the last six days might be uh, called like a nuclear event. And so um, you've heard a lot of prominent voices say that this is, this is going to be the death of crypto, that we really have a very tough road going forward. Why are they wrong? 2018, we saw the cleanse of all these crazy ICOs all over the place. And um, I think now we're going to see a bit of a cleanse of just this focus, this in, 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 in incessant focus on price and trading and, and crypto, where we've somehow avoided the sort of the benefits of, not avoided, but neglected, I'd say, the benefits of blockchain technology um, and its transparency. And I, and I, I do hope, perhaps, that it's we have a phrase in Volker Forge like utility, not hype, that perhaps we might start actually building into the, like, the utility of what blockchain can bring to, well, in our, in our case, the gaming industry. I mean, uh, as I said, as I said, the NFT ownership, transparency, economies in the virtual world, these are all things which are fascinating to us, and I think which is something the metaverse touches on um, <clears throat> a little bit, and hopefully a lot of bit um, in times to come. And so, yeah, so I, I think this, this cleanse is probably much needed for the space, and I think a, a refocus on why we're involved in blockchain in the first place, um, as opposed to just sort of random tokens popping out of nowhere, is, um, is something that benefits us, especially in the gaming world. I really am fascinated with where we go. Jamie, you and I were talking back backstage about your efforts for Vulcan in metaverse builds and, and where we go from here. A recent report by Gartner actually suggested that 25% of people globally will be spending at least one hour a day in the metaverse by 2026 which seems insane, um, but I believe that we will go there. I don't know that it will be the imagination of the metaverse that we currently see um, or what that immersive environment will look like, but I do believe we're going there. With that being said, if that is a true statement or even remotely accurate, that represents a massive opportunity for not only mind share attention, um, but commerce and, and disrupting the way we do transactional business as we know it. Where are you focusing to stay uh, ahead of that curve and for anyone that you give counsel where should they be paying attention to or looking to you know make investments in right now um well i'll, I'll start on this one because i'm a lot of the talks i do is you know metaverse related i don't want to sort of drone on and on about what i, what I think the metaverse is i'll just sort of try and bullet point where <laughs> what, what i do because i think let's be honest we're in a very we're in an infancy stage of <clears throat> not even the metaverse, but in defining the metaverse. I mean, on one side, you've got the Zuckerberg and the Apple metaverse of VR headsets and Oculus and um, sort of holograms, all that sort of hardware tech. On the other side, you've got the sort of blockchain um, games and sort of economies within virtual world saying they're the metaverse. And then, so I think we're still kind of sort of defining what it is. I mean, I mean, you could really trace it back to sort of second life or any sort of world where you detach yourself from reality and go into a world where you're doing something else, perhaps with an economy. So I, th I think even second life had Bitcoin involved. You could say that's a metaverse. So the metaverse has always been around to an extent, but it's just now we're just seeing it thrown in our faces. In terms of the blockchain element of it, of course, we're a blockchain gaming company. I think it's taken us a while to kind of realize that there are three, three different types of sort of blockchain game. You've, you've got gaming with NFTs, you've got play to earn, and then you've got the metaverse, which I, I would define now as a virtual, uh, an economy within a virtual world. Um, play to earn has had its, it had its moment, and we've realized that you know, if you're going to go down the play to earn route, then just be honest and say, okay, this is what we're doing. We're trying to make a sustainable model to help those through a sort of visual, sort of visual representation in the game, because a lot of the games aren't exactly great because they're making money. But yeah, to go back to your question, is the metaverse going to be the future? You know, even even as a metaverse company, I'm not going to be. Um, 
arrogant enough to say, yes, 100% it is, because we don't know. Um, what we do know is this technology has been around for a while. Um, I think um, economy is always, always going to be ar around for, uh, forever. Um, human interaction with, within socializing is. So if you can combine those two. So yeah, I think economies within virtual world is where I would place the definition of, of metaverse to that extent. I think it's really interesting. Forbes just released uh, some of its forecasts for the APAC region, and they actually uh, alluded to the opportunity in industrial metaverses, uh, saying that they actually see that investment doubling over the next year, and they highlighted BMW's new uh, digital design studio in China, and then also a collaboration between Unity Technology and Hyundai. Um, so where do you see the industrial side, that other side of blockchain, smart contracting, crypto adoption, that is not the sexy, you know, 1,000x run of a token, um, but it's going to really power where we go from here. It's not hard to sort of see how, you know, this technology can be used um, with B2B. I mean, especially if we're talking about sort of, you know, VR and, and AR and sort of all this educational technology and, and blockchain transactions and, and, and such. But I think we have to sort of look how blockchain could be used well, in, in, in our industry, in gaming. Look what worked before. Gaming's worked before, economies have worked before, socializing has worked before. Now, how can blockchain, blockchain technology sort of combine and marry the three of those? And, um, well, it, it's quite simple. I mean, you have the transparency, you have ownership, and all the sort of um, the economies that we, we are all familiar with. Whether or not sort of the Web2 community or the, the community not, um, uh, what's to say, uh, learned with blockchain technology are going to move over, it's hard to say. Um, it's hard to say if gamers will ever will ever want to sort of leave the pay-to-earn model. I mean, still the pay-to-earn model in, in, um, with no blockchain or NFTs is a multi-billion dollar industry, and the blockchain gaming industry is, is only, you know, maybe 100 to 200 million or something silly. Um, so people are still willing to pay for centralized games. People are still willing to not have NFTs. People are still willing to sort of uh, abandon the whole play-to-earn model. And, you know, there are reasons why I think that is the case, you know, especially with play-to-earn, which is, you know, once you put your mind in that, that, that money-making set, you don't want to play the game anymore. It's not a game anymore. It's, it's about making money. So it, it's, it's sort of straddling that fine line between working out how can you integrate blockchain technology to allow the consumers to either enjoy themselves more or benefit more. And benefit more is the easy one, of course, where you have economies within the games, but enjoy it more, it, it, it is a tricky one. I mean, it's a tricky one to sort of circle that square in the gaming market. But, um, but yeah, uh, ownership and transparency is, is certainly the two biggest benefits that we see within, within virtual worlds and, and blockchain. Self-policing could be a massive component to it, but we don't have that leadership right now. We don't have that clarion voice who's saying, this is what we're going to do, this is our standard, and we will do real-time transparency or reporting. And in a situation like this, especially given what's just recently happened, sunlight is the absolute best deodorant of all, um, but I don't see anyone stepping up. I mean, what would you have done differently? What should have been done differently up to this point? Maybe using FTX or any one of the you know last yeah. several major high-profile failures, what could have been done differently and how could they have been more transparent? Most of my days in and out sort of telling our team to design Medusas and what sort of Centaur should hold and, you know, all, all sorts. So it, it, I'm not going to pretend I know much about sort of the, uh, the finance, the regulations of it all. I mean, we, we moved into blockchain <clears throat> um, by chance, actually, as it, as it were, and sort of PYR did as well as it did, I guess, because we already had many established games and projects which were far sort of further developed than other blockchain games at the time, and we rode the Axie wave up. Um, so um, I would say on the regulatory front, the only ones I do know are sort of gaming related <clears throat> and they, um, it's tough when you, when you add any sort of financial incentive or an economy in a game because you're, you're immediately sort of playing with, with things that sort of institutions and banks want a part of, so you've got to play by the rules. Um, the, the three that I can think of that really sort of we have to sort of navigate our way around are, first of all, the NFTs. I mean, I was very excited when Apple said they were going to allow NFTs. Um, in the game, in their mobile apps, because obviously mobile gaming is an enormous market, and then that sort of that happiness sort of flipped, did a U-turn when I realised that, that um, they said, well, you can use NFTs in the Apple games, but you have to purchase it through the Apple, the mobile app. Now, it's not so much I care about the sort of the 30% tax, whatever they want to put on it. It's just, it's just completely, it, it, it's, um, what's the word? It's, just, it's just impossible to sort of implement that kind of technology where people are, can transfer NFTs outside of 
the app and they can sort of buy them outside the app. And of course, you know, where do you define what's bought inside the mobile app and what isn't? And, um, and what blockchain would you use in, in Apple? So I don't, I don't think they thought that out properly, but maybe to step in the right direction. Um, the other two I'd say, regulatory wise, on a gaming front, of course, you know, gambling, which we don't do anyway, um, it's not allowed. And, and the strange one, which you didn't, may, might not know about, is something called loot boxes, <clears throat> where, in fact, World of Warcraft and these bigger games aren't even allowed to do them now. I mean, when you, when you click, on a, click on an item and you don't know what it is, if it's a sword and it's centralized, then who cares, because it's a sword. However, if you're giving that value, like an NFT value, and all the blockchain games sort of based on NFTs that have value, let's say you find a treasure chest in the, in the underworld of Hades and open it up and it's, you know, I don't know, the, the sword of Achilles. Now, if that has a, a monetary value, but anything over a cent, you, uh, it's illegal in a lot of countries because it, it, it's loot boxes are a type of gambling where if you don't know what's in it and you're playing to sort of get that sort of valuable item and it is valuable, then you, you've broken a law in, in a large amount of um, or Western countries anyway. So it, it's navigating. But the minute you add sort of an economy and a finance to any sort of infrastructure and gaming, you are, you are entering a world which, um, from a game studio's point of view, is, is new and it's a little bit heavy. But on the flip side, as you brought up the Axie, uh, Axie model, I mean, it can be incredibly beneficial. I mean, you know, the, the whole play to earn model was utterly unsustainable how Axie presented it, but I think it opened the doors for, for well, the metaverse sort of uh, uh, theme and trend on, on blockchain gaming. But also, I think, I think if, you, if you're going to go down the play to earn model, and I think you, you can, you've got to say from the, from the outset, set your KPI and say, listen, we're doing this. Either are we doing it to make money or are we doing it to help? Now, there can be a balance there. You can say, OK, listen, I mean, play to earn does have a way of helping developing countries because it is borderless transactions. And it is, you know, a fun, I, I use that word loosely because actually it wasn't exactly, you know, Call of Duty or whatever, but it was a visualized way of making money and it is borderless. So if you're going to do it, go into it with the fresh eyes and say, let's make it sustainable. Let, that secondary token, let's give it utility. Let's give it, a, you know, you have to reach a certain exp exp experience before you can pull those tokens out. Um, let's stop, you know, all, all this farming and make it sustainable where that token retains its value. So there are ways to do it. And I, and I think I, I, I flip back and forth on Play to Worm because I, you know, I think it's a, it's a mindset which is just, you know, it's not gaming and it's not sustainable. But if you can make it sustainable, say, listen, this is to, to allow those in developed countries to make money in a fun way, then yeah, it can be done. But um, yeah, in terms of the FDX and all the crypto monetary stuff, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend I, I know much about it other than there's some, some crazy stuff going on right now and everyone's getting affected. But our gamers are still gaming, so that's all that matters, I suppose, for us. Well, I, I personally, and this is from someone who throws one of the largest conferences in the NFT space, think NFTs is an awful moniker for what the underlying technology really supports. And I think much the same of play to earn gaming. I think that's a little too narrow casted. I think play to experience, play to access, that gets a lot more interesting as a conversation at that point because then it's a, a more, to your point earlier, rich immersive experience. You're not just myopic in your worldview. I'm not going to, you know, because earning $5 a day is not going to be a meaningful amount of money for much of the developed world. And so how do you get mass adoption of a global gaming title? Um, Going back to APAC, I'm really interested because it's been an explosive e uh, region for Web3 and crypto companies. Um, White Star Capital came out with a report. There are over 600 currently in the region. How do we continue to develop that ecosystem and how do we see that number go over the next, say, three to five years from 600 to 6,000? It's either going to be enormous or it's not i mean it's it's simple as that i mean if you look at if you took at asia specifically i mean the, ga the gaming market i mean we it's absolutely enormous and i, I always say I always say in some of these talks i say like you know the definition of success is when a child walks into a playground and says <clears throat> do you have or this is the cool thing to have and the moment a kid comes into school and says well but has your game got an nft in or has your game got vr or anything sort of blockchain related then you know you're literally on the cusp of an absolute ep epidemic of, of, of proportions of, of spreading through every single um, country. So I, I think we don't know. I think we're toying around with it a little bit. I think Axie was the first sort of press into it. And I know Ubisoft and some other gaming companies are sort of, you know, um, fraying at the edges and sort of saying, well, is this going to work? I know that Ubisoft had a terrible reaction to sort of putting NFTs in their game. And uh, I know World of Warcraft and Blizzard don't even need NFTs. They've got billions of dollars turnover of people paying. And I still pay for sort of mobile games, like a dollar here, $500 in a month. You think, oh my God, on Angry Birds, you know, people are still paying. But the minute 
that trend shifts and people do expect free to play and sort of NFTs and blockchain technology and economies within it, and that seems to be the norm, then it's going to go from 0 to 100 in an absolute tiny time. And um, I like to think that some of us will be at the forefront of it. But we don't know. We don't know, yeah. Uh, I think um, crypto, just you talk to a plurality of people, or at least conversations I have, and you explain what's needed with a MetaMask wallet. And I mean, you can see their eyes start to glaze over. And so for me, I see projects like what Starbucks is doing with their loyalty program. They've got 25 million installed users in the US, and I believe just north of 100 million worldwide. They're going to an NFT driven platform but they're never mentioning the word crypto. So from a front-facing standpoint, it's just a better mousetrap. But how do, and we're winding down very, very quickly, so I'll look for brief answers. What's the biggest blind spot? How do we remove that friction across any aspect of crypto? I think links we're, we're having with blockchain technology and adoption is a, um, it's a very sort of adult-oriented business. We're sort of going from sort of adult and mature technology sort of driven companies to try and work out how to help help the sort of same peers. Where to gauge the success of something, to gauge the adoption of something, we need to look at the younger generation a lot more. Look what children are using. Look what works for them. Because these, you know, I, I remember when Google was introduced when we were at school. Um, it was after that they became. But then, um, wider and sort of like Facebook was introduced at university. So that's why Minecraft and Fortnite, these are the massive, massive sort of applications used by the youth. And if, if you see them they're adopting blockchain technology or you sort of tailor your products towards them and they adopt it, then that will be the future. So I think the missing link would actually be looking at a younger demographic. I think the takeaway is the future is still quite bright.